Before he joined Sociomantic, he was actually a key person in performance measurement on solar modules using D. And he was also the author of an industry standard numerical modeling program for solar that's, that's still used by the whole industry. So uh, in a lot of ways, he, he can also be called Mr. Bright, uh, even though he's not a Walter. With that, Don, please. Yes, so, so I know a lot about uh, glass, industrial inkjet, semiconductor device physics, and women's shoes. <laughs> now, I'd like to thank Kai for his talk yesterday that gave me a fantastic introduction. You could see it in his eyes, you could hear it in his voice. Even a top-notch programmer can have a thoroughly miserable experience with floating point. I've called this talk Using Floating Point Without Losing Your Sanity because my first experiences with floating point as a young programmer were disturbing. I had written code that was obviously correct. It was so simple, it was obviously correct, and it didn't work. And so I was sure that everything was correct and it wasn't. Something I was sure of was wrong. I failed my own sanity check. And I went through a couple of bad nights of thinking I was losing my mind. When this kind of thing happens to you, and I think it's common for a lot of programmers, you can get a crisis of confidence. I don't trust the floating point code that I write anymore. And I went through a period where, for cases where I needed to use something with flo where floating point was an obvious solution, I should use floating point, I was scared. And so I rewrote my code to entirely use integer arithmetic. And it was convoluted and messy, and I bet I'm not the only person that's ever done that. Fundamentally, the problem is, with this flicker, floating point is a bit niche. The specialists in floating point, the numerical anal analysts, are rare. And yet, ordinary programmers use floating point all the time, not in a sophisticated way, but just for day-to-day -day tasks. Calculating percentages, adding lists of prices or something. Simple stuff. And I felt that, at the time, I felt that there was advanced mathematics that I didn't know that was preventing me from writing good code. I don't feel this way anymore. I don't have this lack of confidence anymore. And I want to share in this talk, in this talk I want to uh, share with you some of the reasons, some of the ways where my thinking has changed. And I found, for giving a talk on floating point without losing your sanity, in some ways I'm the worst possible person to be giving this talk because I actually think floating point is fun. And so I've clearly lost my mind. <laughs> so it's, floating point is a lot more fun if you view it as magic. I think this is a, I don't know the history of this building, but it seems like this is a place where Stage magicians would have once um, done performances. It's got that kind of feel. So, unfortunately, I'm not a performer. But I'll start with a child's magic trick. Think of a number. 
double it, add eight, take away the num halve it, take away the number you first thought of, and your answer is four. Amazing! <laughs> the interesting, uh, what I find interesting about this is why young children find this magical. It's of course because they don't know algebra. They don't have expectations for how numbers work. I know when I was uh, oh, seven or eight years old and I encountered this, I did a kind of bisection. I couldn't work out how this worked and I tried removing steps and seeing what happened. So I think I was a programmer even back then. <laughs> um, but eventually I worked out the magical bit is this line, the second bottom line, take away the number you first thought of. You've got two numbers and you don't know what they are, you don't know what either of them are, but take them away and you've got something that you know. Something a bit more interesting. An adult's magic trick, almost exactly the same. <laughs> but <laughs> adults, to make it simpler for the adults, there's a lot less steps. Think of a floating point number, add 35, and take away the number you first thought of. Well, of course, put a thousand in, of course, the answer is 35. Now, let's try a billion. And I want a puff of orange smoke here. 64! <laughs> Your 35 has turned into a 64. Yeah. There's another trick you can do with the same function. Let's try a vanishing act. Let's try five billion. Blue smoke this time. And it's not! <laughs> 35 has gone. You can, you can make even really big numbers disappear this way. <laughs> There's a name for this last um, step. It's called catastrophic cancellation. All the information is gone. But that's a kind of sensationalist um, title. And yeah, that last one is a big problem, but the second last one is not good. <laughs> in fact, I think with the, in the last case, where the answer is zero, that's pretty obvious that something's gone wrong. But the 64, if you've got a late night debugging session and you've got a mysterious 64 and you track it down to that code, you're going to have a very unpleasant night. <laughs> so why does this happen? Well, the reason is pretty simple. A float is a 32-bit number just a few bytes, and it can only store four billion different numbers. And the number that we want, one billion and 35, is just not on the list of numbers that it has. It's not representable. The closest, it's, the closest that it has is one billion and a billion and 64. So it gives you a billion and 64. You ask for a billion and 35, Here's a billion and, and 64. So we're putting the uncountably infinite real number line from mathematics into a 32-bit float. We're pulling a trillion rabbits out of a 32-bit hat. It's magic. And so... I have this model that floating point is actually a conjuring trick. We've only got these few billion numbers we can represent, and we're trying to represent, we're pretending we can represent everything. Well, the four, if you could only have four billion numbers for maths, what would you pick? Well, you might pick pi. No, that's not in there. 
Square root of two? No. Uh, how about point one? No. Okay, let's see, what have we got? Addition isn't even associative. 35 plus a billion, we just saw this one, minus a billion is 64. But 35 plus a billion minus a billion is 35. Why are we using this grotesque, fraudulent type? It's lies. Well, the reason is pragmatism. Floating point is a success story. Modern engineering is built on floating point calculations. We've got hardware, floating point hardware is ubiquitous, it's everywhere, it's cheap. And now GPUs are even multiplying the effect even more. We've got devices that can do masses of floating point in parallel, and we've got GPU power now exceeding CPU power. And it turns out that despite being this horrendous approximation, 64-bit floating point is actually good enough for almost everything. Everything we want to do, we can do with this, even though it's lying. The whole thing's a trick. So I'd like to give you the two worlds model. There are two worlds going on here. There's the mathematician's world over here. The uncountably infinite real number line. This is the world where algebra works. On the other side, we have the magician's world on the stage. In reality, we've got four to 10 bytes. And the problem is that sometimes we try too hard to stay in the mathematician's world when we're actually in the magician's world. And we get a lot of wrong ideas, some misconceptions. One of the popular misconceptions about floating point is that somehow it's fuzzy. Somehow it's not deterministic. And you can understand that because we saw that pretty bizarre um, billion and 35 turning into 64. But actually, though floats don't obey normal algebra, they do obey their own algebra, floating point algebra. And that has some interesting properties. And one of them is that if you do a calculation using ints and do that using doubles instead, it actually gives you the same result. If the integer calculation was exact, so is the floating point calculation. It's not actually, it's not actually worse. As long as it doesn't overflow, you're fine. In fact, what a double is, it's a 54-bit integer with a bonus. If you go outside its range, it still gives you an answer. If you divide, you get a fractional part, but still, it's got everything an int can do, plus more. And a lot of people also have a funny idea that because we didn't get the, the number that we asked for, that a billion and 64 in floating point means every number between a billion and 33 and a billion and 95. And, but in reality, a billion and 64 means a billion and 64. All the other numbers are aliases. It's kind of like if you, go to Henry, if you went to Henry Ford and said, give me the reddest Model T Ford you have, and he would give you a black Model T Ford. It's the reddest he's got. <laughs> and the final misconception is that floating point is weird. Now, this is, of course, kind of true, but it's not as actually abnormal as you might think. Lots of things in the real world actually behave this way. For example, suppose you try to measure the weight of a grain of sand. Get a three-ton truck and weigh it. Put a grain of sand on that, put your grain of sand on that truck and weigh it again. 
Now, subtract the two numbers to get the weight of your grain of sand. You're probably going to get zero, or maybe even negative. We do, this loss of precision actually is an everyday uh, phenomenon that we experience. You never know anything precisely. And so, in some sense, it's kind of mathematics is weird. Real world is not as nice as mathematics. So, in the, in the magician's world, floats are just ints with a scale. You've got a sign, a mantissa or a significant, and an exponent. And the number is just the mantissa times two to the power of the exponent. And if the exponent's zero, it's just an integer. The most important... Whoa. <laughs> and I thought floating point was weird. Okay, I'll be good from now on, I promise. <laughs> oh no, I don't know why everything's selected. <laughs> yep. So the most important property of this struct, and the one that causes us the most problems, is the precision, the number of bits in the mantissa. And I think it's helpful to think of this, oh, you can get this in D by using the mantdig property. That gives the number of bits of precision. And I think it's best, I think it's helpful to think of the, this precision as a budget this is how much money you have to spend. The larger the precision, the more extravagant you can be, the more wasteful you can be. Now, if you're using a float, you've got 22 bits, and you have to be frugal. You cannot waste any bits. If you've got a double or a reel, especially if you're lucky enough to have a machine with a quadruple, 112 bits, you can do whatever you like, practically. And every operation that you do is going to use up your budget. Something that really surprised me, that I didn't expect when I first started using floating point, is that multiplication is not a problem. I'm used to thinking of multiplication as bad, right? and you multiply something, like it takes a long time, or every property is bad, but addition's simple. In fact, with, for floating point numbers, it's the opposite way around. Multiplication never introduces errors. And division, not too bad either. But it turns out the dreadful thing that you must never do is take away the number that you first thought of. That's where we get the magic trick. You run the risk of everything disappears. No matter how many bits you've got, if, you're, if the number you're... If you've added um, numbers that differ, where the scales differ too much, you can lose all your precision. Then there's funny values. There is actually a negative zero, but you can hardly ever see it. It only comes out at night. <laughs> and the reason it exists is because tiny numbers get rounded to zero. 
And the processor likes to keep track of, did they come to zero because they were positive and got smaller, or were they negative and they got closer to zero that way? It keeps track of that and hardly ever tells you. Worse is if the exponent is the maximum value it can be, then you get a value of infinity or not a number. You get infinity when you did something that made a number that was bigger than it could cope with. Adding two of the biggest numbers together or something like this. You can also get it if you divide by zero. One divided by naught gives you infinity. One divided by zero, if the zero was a negative, if it, turned out, if it was secretly a negative zero, you'll get negative infinity. And that's about the only way you can find out which type it was. But not a number. That's the, this is the bad guy. When something evil happens. Well, if you get an infinity and you take infinity away, it could, could be anything, you've got no idea, and it gives you a not a number. I was discussing with, with one of our um, co-workers about what the symbol for a not a number would be, because it's kind of like an infinity but warped, and I think an infinity and a zero would look kind of like a pretzel. <laughs> it's not a number, it's a pretzel. And also, if you get naught and divide by naught, you also get nan, not a number. And those guys are bad. They give you nightmares. The hardware does give you some help with that, though. The hardware, the guys who designed this realize that this is a problem. And you can actually enable hardware traps. If these guys get created, you can get a hardware interrupt thrown. And you can do something nicer like make your program crash instead of just going insane. Um, interestingly, the word exception, you might wonder why they called floating point exceptions when they're interrupts. They used this word before C++ started using it to mean exceptions. This is older. These are the original exceptions. The problem is, with this hardware support, there isn't one for this total lo loss of precision that's reliable. The problem is, you got a billion and you added 35 to it. It gave you a billion and 64. That was the best it can do. If you're if you, as long as you stay with big numbers like that, that's perfectly fine. You won't get any errors. It's not a problem. It's not a bug. Nothing to worry about. It's only if you do the take away the number you first thought of that you get this problem. But of course, after it's got to that step, it's got a billion and 64, and you subtract that, you get zero. Yes. David. Hello? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, there, <clears throat> I think there is a, is there a hardware trap for subnormal numbers? There is. Okay, so there is a hardware trap for something close to catastrophic cancellation then. Yes. But not, not with addition, maybe. Yes, there is. Okay. <laughs> now... I need help. <laughs> no, but I'm enjoying it anyway. Is it working? Testing. Um, while you're looking at that, while technical difficulties are being resolved, may I ask a brief question? Um, is there like a safe floating point that detects if the um, difference in the scale of the, of the, sorry, the exponent of the mantissas is significant enough to lose data? Like, it could be done procedurally, couldn't you? You could just look at the exponent of two numbers, see if it's equal to the size of the mantissa in bits, 
and then kind of give a warning? There is, yes. The, the process that does have a flag for exact, has any precision been lost at all? And so if you do integer calculate, if you've had something that you were doing with the integers and you want to get exactly the same result with floating point, you can set that on and you can check it and that will be triggered if any, if any errors happen at all. But the problem is it happens all the time. There's not much you can do that won't trigger that. And the problem is that this... I've presented these extreme cases of numbers changing and disappearing, but in fact, what's happening is that you're losing, you're losing a couple of bits all the time. It's gradually, your budget is gradually being eroded all the time. And those examples that I showed you are just the extreme cases where it's completely eroded away and everything's gone. Um, but the hardware, doesn't, the hardware can't really distinguish between is this something where something has cat suddenly catastrophically gone wrong or whether it's just eroded and eroded and eroded and now it's all gone. I'm going to talk about equality. And there's this conventional wisdom that you should never use equals equals with floating point numbers. And the reasoning behind this is because Equality destroys the illusion. It's not a... You're, you're nicely in the mathematician's world, but you use equals equals, you expect to stay there, but you're not. You're thrown into the magician's world. Because what X equals Y really means is X and Y are equal to as many significant figures as the CPU supports. And that's kind of arbitrary. It exposes the impl it, it's exposing an implementation detail. If you've had any round off at all, it's not going to the numbers are not going to be equal. But equality is kind of a it's mostly it's in the magician's world. Sometimes it's in the math, mathematician's world. So it says negative zero and positive zero are equal, even though they're actually different. And then there's the horror. Not a number is not equal to not a number. Now, I think I, I, think I understand why they did this, why it was defined this way, um, but I think it was a mistake because... A consequence of this is that if you have a float, a float x, and it's not a number, then x is not equal to x. And I think any type, any, any variable that is not equal to itself is wicked. That's, that's in denial. <laughs> of course it's equal to itself no matter what it thinks it is. So we've got a mix of some, some implementation details are exposed and some are hidden. But I wouldn't say don't ever use equals equals. It's, it's still useful for low-level code and unit tests. And... So what alternatives do, for equality testing do we have? Well, and this is my fault. X is Y. This is just, if you've got two floats and you say X is Y, then it's just a bitwise compare. Are they exactly the same? So then NAN, NAN is NAN. A dog is a dog. What? Yeah. They're different. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
just, it's a wifey doing a bit pattern. The question that you might ask then is, can we do a better equals? No, not really. What we can do so that we get equality even in the presence of bits being eroded, our budget disappearing, we can reduce the number of bits that are equal. So I created a function in standard.math with an unfortunate name, um, which gives, given two numbers, x and y, it tells you how many bits they are equal to. The problem is, how many should be equal? It's how long is a piece of string? It's arbitrary. It depends on your application. So you can't do a standard value like... Uh, excuse me. Uh, when you say they are equal, uh, does it gives you how many bits are equal. Does that include both the Mantessa and the exponent, or just one of them? The only the mantissa. If the exponent is different, it'll give you zero. Okay, thanks. Thank you. But it does do the case where the exponents are different, but the numbers are close to each other. Negative zero and positive zero uh, uh, has no common uh, have no common bits. Yes, it has a fictional returns zero for. Uh, no, they are they are they are adjacent numbers, so they differ. I think they differ. They okay. differ by either zero or one. Okay. So that all the bits are the same. But in something like physics, there actually isn't an exact equality either. And I've got a physicist background, and for me, I'm used to not having real equals. You always have to specify the precision. So is the speed of light 3 by 8, 3 by 10 to the 8 metres per second? Well, to low precision it is, but sometimes you need more accuracy and floating point numbers, sadly. You're more in a physicist's world than a mathematician's world. Um, so, so why, uh, if we, we need the precision always, um, why doesn't uh, it is provided? So uh, we, uh, we've heard from uh, a proposal for UNUM, so um, you, you can carry uh, the precision, which is already valid, or the error, um, together with the number, and, and then you're better off. Yeah. That's, that's a, did everyone hear that? Yeah, there's a UNUM proposal which would carry the, how much precision the number has in the float. And why don't we have that already? Well, the original uh, floating point standard was done in the, um, done and implemented at the same time in uh, about 1981, or maybe even in the 70s in the 8087, and they didn't have many transistors that they could make chips out of. And they really did an amazing job of, of developing, of developing this, um, this chip. And so, it's pragmatism wins again. This, this is what we had. There's, there are for sure ways that it could be better. Um, but barring some kind of miracle, I'm not sure that it's going to happen. Um, IEEE arithmetic is a lot better than what we had before that. Um, floating point systems in the 50s, 60s and 70s had these really bizarre implementations. And a nice thing about D is it's standard. You can assume it always stays the same. So that reduces the extent of weirdness. D also gives you these built-in built floating point properties. 
that I've used before in these slides. Infinity, not a number. Mant, Dig. Epsilon, Max. And in my experience with writing, especially with writing low-level code, this really helps so much. It makes them feel, makes the weird stuff feel more accessible. And so I'm much more likely to put these values in tests, unit tests, and so on. And unit tests. I know that my experience of writing floating point stuff with unit tests there to check whatever, to check everything that's happening. Um, Improves the code enormously. It's a great win for D. And static if, I love this guy. It allows you to isolate the weirdness. When you've got a special case that you encounter, you can often special case the special case away um, with a static if. But not everything's great. Sometimes we have Orwellian experiences. What do I mean? I mean, George Orwell's uh, less known book, Numeral Farm. Some numerals are more, all numerals are equal, but some numerals are more equal than others. <laughs> Look at this float x equals 1.3. x is not 1.3. Hey, I asked for 1.3. Why didn't you give me 1.3? There's a float suffix to add to the literal that you can put at the end of the literal. Okay, it's not 1.3, it's 1.3 float. Okay. I'm not sure why that second line compiled, since it's impossible for any float to have that value. This is the closest it can be, but okay, that makes sense. Some kind of sense. Now let's go with a double, set it to 1.3. It is 1.3. Yes, all's well with the world. But it's also 1.3 float. Y is not X. Well, that's good. But 1.3 and 1.3 float are the same. And yet, well, if they're the same, why is X 1.3 and 1.3 float? There's some, so, something's insane there, and it might be me. Don? Don? Yeah. We do that to weed out the, uh, the, the not chosen. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I don't have much in this talk that's relevant to sociomantic, but this one is. This is sociomantic's nine trillion dollar bug. Well, we had this bit of code. If price is less than naught, then that's an error. If price, then we make a bid. So if the price is not zero, then we want to bid on it. We round the price to an integer, and we bid. That was a problem. Price was nan. <laughs> Turns out that, so it entered in there, we made a bid. That round of price turns out to be nine trillion dollars. <laughs> we're lucky we're still in business. We won. We nailed that. <laughs> yeah. So we've got a DMD bug for this. I think that's really nasty. A float, if a, not a number converts to a bool, it's true. I don't know why nan is true. It's not very true to me. <laughs> but really, you should never cast a float to a bool unless you're absolutely certain that it's actually a number. If it's a pretzel, you're in big trouble. So now, I want to talk about generic programming. Because this turns out to be a problem. 
Mathematically, reals are an extension of the integers. All the values, all the operations are carried over. And on a computer, int and float, they both have hardware support. Even better, you can replace int with double and everything will compile. And unless you're unlucky, all your test cases will still work. So this is fantastic. Double is a superset of int. So let's make our code work with any numeric type. It works for ints, let's make it work for doubles as well. This turns out to be a really bad idea. The code will compile, but it will be wrong for floats. It will be correct for some floats, but not all. And the problem is, this two worlds thing, floats are not reals, they are a conjuring trick. They look like they're in the mathematical world, but they are in the magical world. They are not a subset of the mathematical reals, and they are not a superset of ints. They are something different. They're a trick. The values are a superset of integers, but the semantics are not. And for, to write real generic code, we need common semantics. It's not enough that it compiles and looks the same, it actually has to behave the same. So, here's a simple for each range. For any type, we'll take a value from, and we'll do, do a for each over from from to from plus 10. And I've got this, to expose what's going on, I've got this how many variables. How many times did this actually, did this loop run? Pass it 500, it runs 10 times. Pass it 16,777,242 and it runs nine times. Pass it with 18 million and it doesn't terminate. What's wrong with that code? It looks fine to me. But the problem is increment. Suppose you get an integer, you add one to it and take one away. You're back where you started. For floats, it's a lot more fun. Some random number doesn't change. 1.25e to the minus 6. Add one to it, take one away, and you're 1.2. You've lost some precision. Your budget has been eroded. Minus 1e, minus 20. Add one to it, take one away, and you've got nothing. You're bankrupt. Because you did the take away the number you first thought of. And this last one is interesting. 1677250 plus plus goes up by 2. And the reason is, there's no 16777251. It jumped. And so, I think, I don't, I don't really know why increment is supported for floats. Because, what, what operation is that? It looks like an increment. It means that code like the, like the one on the slide before will compile, but it'll be weird. Now I say don't use doing generic code that works for integers and floats is a bad idea. We've got this is numeric function in Phobos, so I thought I'd look and see where it's used. Well, there's two cases, mostly trivial. There's, one, there's another use in standard.complex. All it does is cast an integer to a floating point and then runs the floating point code. I think that's harmless because it doesn't have an integer implementation. 
and their standard random dot dice. It uses is numeric. Hey, we have a question from the stream. Uh, hope to see 32-bit DMD and D specification IEEE compatible double and floats. Must be IEEE compatible even on x87. I, uh, I support any floating point improvements. <laughs> uh, is, is that a question? Uh, I have to wait for clarification from the internet for that. Yep. Yep. Um, so we've got one use. There's only one real use of is numeric in Phobos, and technically it's wrong. It'll fail for really pathological cases but I don't think anybody ever cares because the probability of failure is about one in several billion. But, but from all the evidence I've seen, I don't think there's such a thing as a mathematical algorithm that can share an implementation between integers and floating point. I think they just don't have any semantics in common. Uh. Well, with Max, there, Max is one of the closest, but there you have two funny cases. You have plus zero and minus zero, which, which is the Max there. You also have what do you do if one of the numbers is not a number? And the IEEE standard actually defines different Max, max and Min for what it should do when one is not a number. If, if you've got a number, not a number and three, which is the maximum, then you can say three. And there's another type, which if one of them is not a number, you get not a number. So <laughs> it's, I, I tried really hard to come up with something that, that would work. And even the trivial ones seem to have problems. So I think for something complicated, for something, you, you can negate numbers safely, I think. <laughs> but, but I don't think there's anything interesting. Another rule of thumb is that more precision is always better. And it's true that more precision improves the accuracy, and it also improves the illusion. So, with, ma with doubles, magic of a billion is 35. We are still in the mathemat mathematical world. 5 by 10 to the 17, we're back in the magician's world. It's a trick. So what happened, when you use more precision, the corner cases move, but they don't actually disappear. Now I want to talk about rounding. There's actually four rounding modes that can be used with floating point, and there's a global setting, which as we know is evil, Four rounding modes can be, can be in force, and this is how they work. There's a round to nearest, which is the default. They can round up, they can round down, and they can round towards zero. The round to nearest is the default one. 2.5 could round to either two or three. But the rule is it always rounds to the even number. And the reason for this is there's a technical reason, but it's on average. It means that on average you won't get a drift. If 0.5 always rounded up, you'd gradually have this slight drift up, upwards and numbers would get bigger. Now, you don't really need to worry about this only in specialised libraries would they change the rounding mode. But...
but it's good to know it. Um, but it's important to know that it does exist and that it does this, that rounding happens, because. When you say you round to the even nearest even number, um, it, it, does that mean even if I want uh, three digits or four digits? Yeah, it, always the last digit will be even. If zero. it was exactly the last at the, bit will be zero. The last bit would be zero. Okay. The reason why this matters is this thing in the D spec. Algorithms should be written to work based on the minimum precision of the calculation. They should not degrade or fail if the actual precision is greater. The problem is this isn't always possible. And the reason for this is double rounding. 3.49 rounds down to 3. Suppose you round it twice. You round it up to 3.5, then if you round it again, you would round up to 4. So we get this tiny difference. Where can we get this extra precision from that the D-spec is talking about? Yeah? We have a clarification. Uh, so again from the stream, DMD automatically extends precision on 32-bit machines. It does not allow to correctly use compensator addition and subtraction algorithms like precision summation, C Python's fsum function, or mir.sum. Would IEEE floating point algebra be fixed in D? Yeah, there's... Um, there is a library function. One of the algorithms does do the... Uh the summation to group them so that the smaller, uh, the smaller values are summed with each other and not mixed up with the larger yep. precision values. We have a complaint from the front that that algorithm is not correct. <laughs> that implementation is not correct. OK, well. <laughs> correct, they actually uh, implemented on DMD in a correct way because of this issue that, or, and similar algorithms. That's what they are pointing out. All right, also, Don, we're, we're running short on time, so. <laughs> yep, okay. So the extra pre hidden precision happens when in the 8087, it's a problem, and some recent processes. If we do float calculations at double precision, multiply them together, we get 44 bits. But if we were using double as an intermediate, there'd be no problem because rounding doesn't actually happen. If we do double calculations at 80-bit reals, double times a double, 188, 118 bits precision, real only has 64 bits, we'll round twice, and that means one in 1,024 calculations has an out by one error. Um, sorry, I don't have enough time to go into this in a bit more detail. In practice, what math library code does is it splits the possible input values into smaller ranges and then it does a different calculation for each range. Now, I want to do an example, a bit of code. Um, this is a root finding algorithm. If you've got a function, any arbitrary function, so going from here to here, and you know that it's above zero on this side, and below zero on this side, you know that it must cross zero at one point. There's an algorithm to find where is the zero, and it's very simple. You try a point somewhere. If it's still below, then you've reduced the range, and you bracket it until you close in on it. The state-of-the-art algorithm for this is called, got the wonderful name of Tom748. Uh, it uses inverse cubic polynomial fitting, and every iteration triples the number of nine bits. If you know one bit, if you know the root to within one bit, after one iteration you get three, then nine, then 27, then 81. It's fantastic. The, the thing I find interesting about this algorithm is it uses binary chop if that fails. To so that it gets good worst case performance. So you get, you get at least one bit per iteration in the worst case. Interesting thing about this algorithm, and they mentioned it in the paper, 
If you give this function a cubic, it takes 1,830 calls to converge. And it's using a binary chop on an 80-bit number. What's going on? And if you use 80-bit reals, you get 16,000 calls. That doesn't sound very binary chop. Well, it's just using a midpoint, like here. Suppose it's one number's really big and the other one's really tiny and the answer is close to the really tiny one. The midpoints that it guesses are 5 by 10 to the 99, 2.5 by 10 to the 99, 1.2 by 10 to the 99, 6 to the 98. We get there after 600 iterations. The exponent gradually drops, very slowly drops. Okay. So, no? There's a follow-on from the live stream. Uh, is the answer implementation is not correct? I don't know. <laughs> but probably. <laughs> We've got lots of things to fix. Um, so, I tried to, I got this algorithm and I tried to fix this. Tried, tried something different. I did, instead of doing midpoint in mathematical space, I did a midpoint in magical space. Just get the raw bits, add them together and halve them. Well, what happens then? Same conditions. The guesses are 5, 2.5e minus 50, 10 to the 75, 10 to the 88, 10 to the 94. It takes us nine iterations to get there. Now you're talking binary chop. So, for 80 bit reels, the worst case improves from 16,000 calls to about 150, because it keeps trying the cubic interpolation. And it's got a similar kind of problem with a linear interpolation step that it does, and fixing that improves the average case as well. And this has been in standard numeric find root for hundreds of years. But this is a couple of orders of magnitude better than the industry state of the art. And I thought it was about time. And nobody knows about it, so I thought I'd mention it. But the moral of this story is, even when floating point code compiles and gives the mathematically correct answer, it can still be algorithmically wrong. It was all, that code worked perfectly in the mathematical world. It was all fine, but it wasn't actually doing a binary chop. So, I'll finish up. Floating point, it's a trick for engineers. It's not actually as mathematical as you imagine. This take away the number you first thought of is an illusion destroyer. If you add more precision, you improve the illusion, but you've still got your corner cases. Using float with its tiny budget is a big... You can do it, but you need to be very careful. Use equality when you want to expose implementation details, and generic numeric code is almost certainly wrong in horrible, subtle ways. And D is mostly a pleasant language for floating point despite the caveats. Thanks. <laughs>